Well, hey, everybody, Wes McDonald here, and I want to thank you for tuning in to another episode of Tiger Tube. And if you're listening and can't actually see us, that means you're joining us on Tiger Pond Radio. I want to thank you for listening in. I'm excited to have Joel Vazel on today and give you a little of his background. He's the chief operating officer at Tiger Paw Software. That's what he does as my boss. And he joined Tiger Paw, though, and this is the part you may not know and why he's being interviewed today, is that he had 20 years of professional services and strategy experience serving a whole bunch of different industry sectors. Uh, Joel also has a PhD, uh, so he's a couple degrees ahead of me, in industrial and organizational psychology from Tulane University. And in past roles, uh, Joel designed and implemented hiring systems and practices, as well as feedback systems for improving employee retention. And that's why we have you on the show today. So thank you for joining us, Joel. Glad to be here. Thanks, uh, thanks for having me. Hey, uh, one of the things I love to do is get people to share one interesting fact that people may not know. A fact that some people know that not everybody knows that I have uh, moved around quite a bit in my life. I'm not a military brat, but I have lived in seven states and eight cities in those states. I, do I doubled up on, on Texas, which is where I'm originally from. And um, now in on my eighth city. Wow. <laughs> well, that's amazing. And I love that interesting fact, because as you do know uh, from speaking with me over the years, that I too have lived in many different places. One of the topics that keeps coming up again and again is this idea of hiring and retention, which is not getting any easier, especially now during the pandemic. So I want to take us through some uh, different questions, and maybe you can help our audience to get a little bit of an understanding from your experience on how we can better deal with this massive problem, right? Now, one uh, thing, Joel, that you've talked about is being intentional about retention, right? And maybe you can talk us through that, right? What does it mean to be intentional about retention? First, let me say that um, if you don't hold on to the employees that you have today, uh, hiring and, and, and staffing your team gets a lot harder. Uh, so I think that's a great starting point for us to talk about the difficulty that people are having right now with hiring is holding on uh, to your existing folks. So being intentional about retention, usually what we think about, what I advise folks is um, that you first start with communicating about who you are. What's your vision? Or where you're going to take your company. Now we focus more than ever on making sure people understand where we're going. Other things that um, we th we talk about when we talk about being intentional about uh, retention is making work work meaningful. Um, people want to know that they the things that they're doing contribute to something bigger. Does this mean you know like uh, you know it's got to be some you know world beating technology or something like that? No. In fact. Wes, when you know, uh, because we talk about this, employees in our company, they know the, what, what uh, impact their actions have on our business financially. That's pretty simple, right? We're transparent about that. Not every company is, is comfortable sharing that, but people know, you know what the impact is of their time um, on our budgets. If they are in a revenue generating role, they know exactly what our goals are from a revenue generation standpoint um, and what it means what that revenue means in terms of our ability to invest in things for our existing employees, for our customers, things like that. So um, the meaning doesn't have to be, again, this uh, huge esoteric idea. Um, other things that, um, you know, particularly in technology services that um, we've seen some of our customers talk about in terms of meaningful work is, you know, cybersecurity, right? It's a, it's a big one right now. And if you are protecting your customers and your job as a technician is to help the customers be protected. That's pretty powerful. There's a lot of meaning in that, especially with the amount of fear that we have around um, cybersecurity. So other things that are, that are things that we practice every day. And I think uh, good, good companies do across all industries is coaching and development. Um, when you think about holding on to people, of course, you want to hold on to your highest performers and high performers typically love to learn and grow. And um, I actually just did a, a skip level with our, our development team recently. And that's one of the things they said they love most about working here is their opportunity to continuously learn and grow. Um, so how do we do that here? One of the most important things that we do is in our annual uh, performance review process, we require our managers to work with every team member to put together a development plan, to ask a question, where do you wanna go next? Uh, doesn't mean that we, you know, it's going to happen tomorrow that we're promising more pay or a, a clear career progression, but it's having that conversation 
and then laying out a plan for how that employee can get there. And uh, for us, one of the things that we really do there is we don't just say, hey, we're going to do it for you and, and hand them everything. We make them work for it. Um, because again, high performers, they want, us, they want that sense of accomplishment that comes from having earned that next opportunity. Um, but it's not just about saying what people can do better or how they can learn. Um, it also is um, about praising and recognizing folks. Super simple, doesn't cost any money. Um, and, and you notice that this is the first time I've actually even mentioned money when I'm talking about retention, uh, because I think a lot of people just think naturally, oh, right now we've got we've to pay more, we've got to get more perks and bonuses and things like that. No, sometimes all you need to do is say thank you. And, and call out something that somebody has done. Um, for us, we're, we're a pretty self-critical company, as you know, and um, we used to, in our regular meetings with the, with, the, with the team members, talk a lot about all the things that we need to fix. And we made a change a little over a year ago to, um, in our daily stand-up meeting, to make sure that not only were we as managers praising, we were giving our uh, every team member an opportunity to praise their teammates as well. I love this idea that you talk about where we're giving recognition and really we can see an extension of that uh, to how we deal with our partners and stuff as well, right? So the work that the organization does with the top 100, right? There was no reason to recognize those folks um, other than that they deserve recognition and to use that to help better uh, the relationships that we have with all of our partners, right? And that really bleeds from the inside out. And I just absolutely love it. I felt that internally at Tiger Paw myself and to see this extension that 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 purpose that you're giving that recognition, even to those that don't necessarily work with us, right? It's a direct reflection of that. Yeah, yeah. actually that makes me think of something else. So, you know, we're a member of the technology assurance group and yep. um, it's, a, it's a pretty elite group of, of technology service providers and they give out a lot of awards, TAG does, to their members for um, for meaningful things. And um, we reached out to TAG just to get some more details about um, you know, what, what our customers who were winning those awards, um, what they did to win it, just so that we could congratulate them. And again, make them feel good about it. Something we didn't have to do, as you said, it, it's just something that we believe is important to, to again, have that positivity and that praise and recognition beyond just our own employees. Uh, so when we, when we talk about this being intentional, uh, what other things should we be considering? Tools. One of the things that is often overlooked is tools, giving your team members the right tools to be successful at what they do. So just think about how we're communicating today, right, over, over this technology. You're in Canada, I'm in the U.S., uh, we're able to do this because our company enabled us to have these tools. So we've, for the most part, have switched to Teams for our internal meetings. So collaboration tools, critically important. Something that is often overlooked, I think, uh, from a tool set standpoint, is hardware. So there's the obvious hardware like headsets if you need those and microphones that um, so you can clearly communicate in cameras so we can see each other. But for us, hardware also means if you're working from home or in the office, having the ability to have maybe a standing desk if that's your thing. Um, or something that we've long done even before I got here is we give people a chair allowance. Um, so you get you know, a couple hundred bucks to go buy the chair that, that um, best suits you. And uh, it's something that people really enjoy. And as, as people have uh, moved to remote, we've had a number of people who used to be in the office say, hey, can I come and get my chair and bring it home? And we're like, absolutely, yes. So, so don't just think about tools from a uh, electronic standpoint, um, but think about you know, hardware as well, things that, that people use every day. And then we of course believe because it's what we do as a business that one of the most important tools that you can provide to folks is business automation software. Something that uh, allows you to minimize paper. Again, with the, with the world of remote, the less paper, the better. Uh, so if you can store all of the information that you need in one spot, also makes it easier for your employees to communicate with each other and to keep things from dropping through the cracks. Uh, something else that helps um, you stay on track is workflows. Uh, if you have uh, notifications that go out automatically uh, based on something else that somebody else did in the company uh, and remind somebody else now it's their turn to pick up the ball and, and, and run with it, you know, fewer balls that are dropped and, um, and happier customers. And, and again, happier employees because they know that they're getting meaningful work done. Um, something else that comes with, uh, with, with business automation is 
giving your employees the opportunity, again, this goes to retention and at recruitment, which we'll talk about here in a minute, uh, the ability to work on, on more high value tasks. So if you've got the right business automation software, those things that people used to do that were time consuming and annoying, and it just, there was just not a lot of, not a lot of thought into them, those things can be automated. And, uh, and again, that makes people um, feel better about the work they're doing. Uh, it goes back to, again, to what I talked about before, about more meaningful work. I could spend more, more time on the high value activities um, and, and you know, increases the communication, the customer satisfaction, which again, goes to meaningful work. So it kind of all, all ties together. I'm a remote uh, employee for Tiger Paw, right? And the tool sets and the ability to collaborate the way that we do makes me feel just as though I was in the office, right? That I think for people that when they incorporate these universal tool sets, when I need help, I don't necessarily just need to call you saying, Joel, how do I do this? I've got an army of people behind me with the experience with those tool sets that I can draw upon, right? So it really does shorten the learning curve for those new hires as well, I would think. Yeah, ab absolutely. Yeah. So think about, um, and I didn't, I didn't mention this, but um, you know, just Office 365 and, and, and SharePoint, or if you're in Google Docs, the ability to share documents to co you know, just simultaneously edit documents has been a game changer for us. You know, we used to be sending attachments back and forth and thinking about, oh, this, is this was this the most recent version of the document? Uh, no more of that, and absolutely speaks to um, our. I mean, you and I, when we when we, we collaborate. Uh, it's a lot easier for us to collaborate than it used to be. It certainly is. And we do a lot of that. And I think a lot of organizations do. And I think it is one of those areas that can be very easily overlooked. And believe me, I've got friends uh, that have jobs where they're working remotely as well for organizations. And because the tool sets aren't there to support them, that it's much, much harder, sometimes agrariously harder for them to actually be able to, you know, learn their job functions, right? So um, to have that background. My brother just got hired for a company. It's actually a property management company. And the tool sets that they gave him are some of the same ones that we use. And he'd never experienced that before. And he said, Wes, I can't believe it. Like, it just makes such a difference in, in starting with an organization, right? So those of us who, who um, take advantage of these tools today, I think we, we often take them for granted. But it wasn't that long ago that, that these things weren't that common. And there's still lots of people who haven't experienced them and, and the benefits of them. But that and, and that actually speaks to something, you know, when you think about, we've been talking a lot about holding on to the employees that you have. The next thing you got to think about is actually getting new employees in. And when you got when you've done a good job of, um, first of all, you know, defining your uh, your your mission, your values and, and all those things that we talked about before, when you've selected those tools now you got to talk about them when you go out there and recruit uh, incredible recruiting tool that, again, I think most people just overlook. Don't even think about putting it in there. Just putting something in your job description that says, hey, yeah, and we're going to give you the tools to be successful in your job. I mean, that, that can be powerful and different, help differentiate your job posting. Especially now. Can you imagine that being a new hire in this age that we live in right now and not necessarily being able to go visit the company in person? Having those tool sets makes it a lot easier. Right. Not only not, only not going to visit, but now you might be you know, working for somebody in a completely different state different country potentially, like you are, um, where you've never heard of the company, right? Because they're, they're smaller, they're local, but this is, this is a real possibility. And so uh, more onus on um, employers like Tiger Paw, like you know, other technology services companies um, to get the word out and, and be really clear about who they are. You know, this is one of those things that seems harder now than ever, right? And as we've talked about uh, with some of the channels that we serve, uh, getting technicians and other folks and everything else has been very difficult, right? So, you know, let's talk about how we actually start getting people involved um, on the hiring end. Uh, how do we do that? How do we be creative and continuous in that recruitment effort? Yeah, those, are the, those are the two words that absolutely say it's, it's got to be creative and it's got to be continuous. Um, you know, interesting story about, about Tiger Paw. We have, um, you know, so we're a software development company. We have the majority of our company is techn technology people. Our office is in Nebraska. Nebraska just broke records for the lowest unemployment um, in U.S. history. Um, it's wow. crazy, and it's and it's particularly hard in technology services um, and 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 programmers. But we're filling jobs, and so a lot of the stuff that I want to share with our audience are things that we're doing 
to successfully bring people in. Um, so constantly being on the lookout for good talent. So this, this is something that I actually learned in, uh, in one of the past industries that I served uh, when I was uh, working with folks in the restaurant industry. Restaurant industry folks, they poach constantly. Um, and there's no reason why others can't do that as well. And um, so when you're interacting with a customer service rep, right, whether it's on the phone or in person, they're doing a great job, that's a potential um, um, hire for you. You're interacting with the salesperson, right? Same thing. Actually, this, this happened uh, to me a little while ago. I was at um, the Sprint store, um, having some, um, some work done on a phone. Uh, and I was talking to the guy that ran the store. Um, really, he was doing actually a very good job of service and sales. And um, I asked him, so have you ever done any B2B work? And he said, yep. Yeah. And I gave him my card. Yes, I still have business cards. It's something that might seem old school, but something that I highly encourage people to still consider. I gave him my card and said, hey, they were looking for another opportunity. We got some good things going on. Give me a shot. Guess what? We had a sales opening. He applied for it. Um, and, and that was, you know, based on that interaction, again, I was looking for that talent. I saw something in this guy. I thought maybe he could be a good fit for us. So have your team. And it's really everybody on the team should be constantly on the lookout um, for uh, a talent that could be a good fit for your organization. Well, and what I love about that story, Joel, is that it's not necessarily people that are in our industry already, right? And that does raise a, a story. I worked years ago for a guy named Bill McLaughlin. And I can remember when I went down for my first uh, couple of days uh, doing field trips with him in New Jersey, we had to rent a car, right? So of course we're at the car rental place and starting to talk to the person that was renting us the car. Uh, so professional, so enthusiastic, but believe me, every upsell opportunity for the insurance and everything else was all in there, but it never felt that way, right? And wouldn't you know it, before we left, Bill said, hey, here's my card. I want you to give me a call. I think I might have an opportunity for you, right? So same thing, because those skill sets sometimes are so universal, I think especially in sales, right? But, but I really love that. You've got me thinking that it's not, it's not just uh, continuously looking for people in our space, but no matter where we are, right? And your sprint uh, story sums that up so well as well. Absolutely true. Doesn't have to be in our industry. But one of the things that we do, um, the, the poaching, the version of poaching that, that we do is we identify targeted companies on LinkedIn and targeted job postings. And we reach out to people. And, and these are these are typically the, the best uh, employees because they're not the ones looking, right? And uh, a message as simple as, as what I described in, the, in, the, in my Sprint Store example is, hey, you know, might have something good going on. We've got a pretty good thing going on here. Give us a shot if you're interested in having a conversation. We actually had our CEO, James, um, reach out to um, a bunch of software developers. He happens to be a former developer. Uh, so we thought it was pretty cool to have a CEO, former developer, reach out to a bunch of developers from companies that we had targeted. And lo and behold, we had a lot of conversations with those folks and got some, uh, some applications out of that. So it's, it's, again, that's that creativity, both of these things. Um, it's creative and it, it's continuous. So, so we do encourage our, our leaders to constantly be looking at targeted companies and targeted roles and just starting conversations. Don't put out boring job postings. Um, job, most job postings, uh, like, like they come, come out of some formula book, right? It's the same stuff over and over. Um, and I would encourage our listeners and viewers to take a look at our job postings because we try very hard to make sure to tell our story about what makes us different in our job postings. And um, the job posting for, for my position when I joined about four years ago is what attracted me to this place. It is unlike anything I'd ever seen before. And again, really tells that story about some of those values that you spoke about earlier um, and, and really talks about what makes this place special. You have to tell your story or sell your story if you want to talk about it that way. Yeah, I'm actually on the Tiger Paw uh, careers page right now, and I just love the intro there, right? You know, release your inner tiger. You deserve to love going to work. And then in brackets, it feels weird at first, but you like it. <laughs> like just little things, right? But that creativity. <laughs> It's yeah, the, the, the feels weird part. I we get that feedback from people who have been in, in other companies. Uh, they come here and there are things that, that, that sometimes it's, it's hard for them to, to get used to doing um, because they're just, you know, for example, if I ask a question, uh, a lot of people assume that I'm giving direction when that's not the case, just because 
that's the type of organizations they come from and the, and the types of leaders they work for. But whatever it is that makes a company unique, that needs to be in the job posting. It doesn't all of, they don't all have to be like us. Not everybody has the benefit of having a, a tiger mascot, right? That they can uh, work in lots of great tiger puns and things like that. But, um, you know, making sure that you tell that story. And again, as I look at our customers uh, I, and I look at their websites and, and check them out, the ones that are, are fully staffed are the ones that are really clear about who they are and about what working for them is like um, when they tell their story. Yeah, and I think no matter what kind of organization you come from, that that creativity, you have that ability as long as you're thinking with that mindset. And that's certainly one thing I'll take away from this is every time I look at that, how can it be more creative in that, right? So looking at what I've done, like, hold a minute, is that just standard stuff that a thousand different companies are going to be doing? Or is there something else that I can do here uh, creatively to make us stand out, to let people know who we really are, right? And, and I think what I love about that creative approach too, Joel, is it's just that it's so genuine, right? That it really forces us to kind of dig a little deeper uh, to help people understand more of who we actually are as an organization, right? Maybe, maybe something that would help our viewers um, and listeners is if they were to ask their own employees, what do they love about working uh, for their company? And take those words and put them in the job post. Find a way to put those in the job post. Go, go beyond the, the, the standard rote stuff about what's required in the job and what the responsibilities are. Those things have to be there, of course. You want people to know what they're getting, you know, what they're getting into from a job standpoint, but from a company standpoint, take it from the words of your own employees. So uh, another thing um, to think about from um, continuously and, and creatively recruiting is partnerships. And I, I think most people immediately think about uh, professional recruiters and partnering with those folks. And um, there's some great recruiters out there. They're struggling with the same reality of the job market that, that um, direct hirers are. Uh, so, so I'm not sure that's the, the greatest solution at the moment. Um, but when we think about partnering, um, we think about a couple of different things. One is the universities and um, trade, trade associations, trade schools, um, especially for technology services um, companies. You know, there's a lot of great, you know, community college programs that are getting people ready for careers in technology. Um, but there's another type of organization out there uh, that, as you know, I'm, a, I'm on the, the board of an, an agency here in Omaha called AIM Institute. Their whole focus is to grow, develop, uh, retain tech talent here in the Omaha market. So they start with getting kids interested in technology in elementary school. They help people all the way up to uh, career changers. They call it um, cradle to gray. Um, so, so they are their their sole uh, responsibility is to work with, and, and it's a, it's a um, kind of a public private partnership. They are a nonprofit, but they work with uh, private companies and universities and try to bring um, the the best of what everybody's got together to focus on our community. And we've had job postings in the past. But they've seen, hey, you guys are looking for somebody. I got somebody over here that's interested in that role. That's not specifically, they're not matchmakers. That's not their job. But because they're so well connected, um, they, can, they can certainly help with that. And us being part of that organization, of course, helps get our name out there because they have lots of uh, really great um, technology-related events in our community. And um, I know there are other organizations like this in, in other uh, locations. And uh, I would just encourage our, our listeners to, to, to find those organizations, find, find the people who have dedicated themselves to getting people interested in technology, for helping them transition into, new, into technology roles and, and build partnerships with those folks. Yeah, and I love that you're involved with AIM and it's really good advice for anyone in their own areas um, because that really does, I think, tie into this whole idea of continuous recruitment that sometimes you have to give back a little to keep that continuous effort going as well, right? And it's not always just taking that by giving because you're giving your time uh, to be able to help with that initiative that it comes back, right? Um, and so, so the last partnership thing I'll say is this is something that I've seen. Um, I was actually really surprised when, when I first heard about it, but um, some of our customers refer prospective employees to their partners. So other companies that they're, you know, they might share customers with. If they have a, a, a role, uh, that you know, maybe maybe they get somebody that applies for a job at their uh, office that's not a great fit for for whatever opening they have, but 
but they know somebody else that they do business with that has an opening, they share. They share um, um, candidates and um, it's brilliant, right? Um, being on the lookout, it just increases your net um, and, and, it's, and it doesn't cost money. Like, so, so again, if you're building those partnerships, um, if you have that spirit of giving that you were talking about in terms of how you help um, your partners, your peer organizations, it'll come back to you as well um, and, and uh, really help you in, in the long run. Because it is so difficult to get people that our first instinct may be, look, let's just take that person right away. It doesn't matter if they're a good fit. Let's find out over time if we can make them a good fit. Um, talk to me about that. Should we compromise on selection? We do not have to, nor should you. Um, the, the mirror fogging test is not sufficient for hiring. Um, so we are very intentional about selection um, and um, a, a clear, consistent um, set of criteria, set of, of hiring practices um, has never been more important. Uh, because if, again, you think about um, what, where we started this conversation with retention, right? So imagine you've got all this work that you've put into retaining your top performers and you hire Joe Schmo off the street, right? Who is not qualified, who uh, other than that he can, you know, he can stand up straight and he can, and he can breathe, right? Um, and he comes in, he's not good at his job, he's not a good fit. What's that gonna say to your employees that you've put all that time and energy into to holding on to? And say, we don't really care about you, we're just trying to fill seats. So absolutely do not compromise on retention. And, and some of the things that you should be uh, aware of and, and thinking about in, in hiring is job hoppers. So it's never been easier for somebody to hop jobs, right? And, and actually that's part of what's going on is not necessarily, there, there definitely are fewer people in the workforce today, but there are more people making um, job changes. Um, those who make frequent job changes, we call them job hoppers. Um, and we have a saying in the, in the employee selection space, which is um, past performance is the, the, the best predictor of future performance. So that holds with, uh, with job hopping as well. If somebody is a job hopper and you think, ah, I'm going to give them a place to settle down, you're, you're fooling yourself. Uh, so we, we look for, um, in our own candidates, ideally a minimum of two years. And um, even if it's, you know, if it's two years, but you've got two-year job, two-year job, two-year job, two-year job, we're, we may not be interested. Um, you know, I would say there's an exception to that. If somebody is showing a clear career progression as they've made their hops, that's a little bit different story. Although I would argue that um, the best performers are the ones that actually have career progression within the same organization. Uh, but yeah, avoid job hoppers at all costs. You do not have to compromise and take that. You also should never compromise on um, culture and a culture fit. Um, that is something that I think a lot of people overlook especially in technology services, right? You want somebody who, who gets the job, who knows the technology, and um, who cares if, you know, if, if, if they're a good culture fit. That, again, goes back to my point I was making before. If you hire somebody who's not a good culture fit, you're going you're gonna to make your existing employees mad. It's going to be harder to hold, hold on to that. So you know, some things that we do um, in, in terms of that is we have specific questions that we ask around culture fit in all of our interviews. We also include prospective team members in the interviewing process. Really easy to say they don't have time for it, right? Uh, because they're busy or you might be short staffed, but um, giving them an opportunity to, um, to talk to prospective team members, um, people they might be working with, goes a long way towards retaining them, but also to the person that you're hiring, it, it, it tells them a lot about who you are and gives them a preview of who are the people they might work with. So um, it, it's something, you know, ensuring that culture fit, you absolutely cannot compromise on that. It has to be in, in, your, um, in your hiring process. It raised another story. I'm not sure if it's urban legend or if it's an actual true story, uh, but it said that Thomas Edison, uh, whenever he would interview somebody to come in to work for him for the first time, uh, he would always uh, serve them soup first. And, and there would be a salt and pepper shakers on the, on the table. And he would wait to see how they approach that. So if they tasted the soup first, then added the salt and pepper, or if they immediately went to adding salt and pepper, right? <laughs> this idea that he didn't want people that added the salt and pepper right up front, 
because they were making assumptions, right? He wanted them to be, you know, people that culturally, you know, were more inclined to ask questions first to go through experience and then make those modifications, right? Um, so I, I want to go back to actually something, the story that you told earlier about the car rentalist, this assumption that um, we've got to hire people who already know how to do the job. Um, so one of the things we talk about is hire for aptitude, train for skill. Um, so if, if they have shown um, in their career based on uh, in, or in their educational pursuits, um, ability to learn information and, and to grow and to be successful in, um, in challenging roles, you can train them. And, and, you, and you might think I'm crazy saying this to technology services companies, right? The, with, with the, um, with the, the crazy needs right now for expertise in, in technology. But I would challenge our viewers and listeners to, to look at their existing employee base and, um, and ask themselves, how many of them knew um, when they were hired all the stuff they know today about the technologies that they are responsible for uh, providing and servicing uh, to customers. And, and actually, I'm, I'm guessing that actually many of the uh, people who are running technology services companies, they just started figuring things out on their own. And that's, how, that's why they're running these companies today, right? That they had that aptitude and they figured it out. Good people will figure it out if they have the aptitude to do it. So in the early days of where my pedigree comes from, uh, for those that aren't familiar with me in the managed print space, um, when we created uh, some software to be able to sort of monitor and manage devices, the dealer community at first was very adamant that uh, technology service companies wouldn't let us install it. They said, no way is an IT manager gonna let us install that, right? And no way can our people speak to that. And I said, absolutely they can. Once we train them on the language of how to talk to IT, what the software actually did, that it was using SNMP to be able to talk to the MIB tables on the devices, using CSV files to export that information back to the customer, right? Um, once they learned that because they had the aptitude to, it just went through the roof. But nobody had that knowledge back then, right? It all had to be learned. So yeah, that, that's my own experience with that. I've seen it happen. So I love to see that actually, uh, you know, painted out what you're saying as well. As you introduced me today, um, you talked about my background and none of it had anything to do with running software company. And, and, and here I am. No, I, I absolutely love that. And, and I agree. And I think going back to that car rental example, that uh, the aptitude was there, but I think also a certain skill set, right? That that person behind the desk was still a salesperson. So even though they had to learn, you know, like you said, some of the specifics in, in a new industry, they still had those basics of what it means to be a salesperson, right? You know, sometimes it's obvious, right? If you've had that interaction like you did in, in that particular situation, but it's sometimes not obvious. And that's where um, the last piece that I wanna talk about in terms of selection comes in and that's assessments. Um, there are a lot of things you can learn uh, from high quality pre-employment selections uh, assessments. And um, yes, that is how I started my career. My professional career um, is helping to design and validate those. Um, I don't sell them anymore, so it's not a shameless plug, uh, <laughs> but it's absolutely something um, you want to consider. Um, the best assessments out there are going to allow you to match um, what they measure to uh, the specific requirements of the jobs that you're trying to find. You can't just take anything off the shelf that's, uh, that's a bit risky. Um, and um, you, know, you want things that are gonna help you figure out that aptitude. Does somebody actually have that skill or that knowledge um, to be able to perform the role um, that, that you're trying to fill? Um, one of the things I like about the assessments that we use, uh, and there are lots of assessments um, that, that do this, is uh, it's not just a pass fail, it gives us um, some ranges, and if somebody's out of range in a particular area, um, it's not saying, oh, you can't hire this person, but it gives you some specific interview questions that you can ask to dive deeper into that particular um, aspect of that person's qualifications uh, to understand uh, if that was just a test-taking aberration uh, or something you need to be concerned about as, uh, when considering this person as a potential employee. So um, there are many good assessments out there and, um, you know, it, if you're not going to compromise on selection, you got to make sure that you, again, are being very systematic about who you're hiring and assessments can be a great part of that effort. Now, Joel, as you know, my wife is a huge football fan, and she points to the fact that oftentimes in the NFL, even they'll hire a certain person for a certain role, uh, like let's say a wide receiver, 
And then after they go through the assessment of their play, they end up putting them in another position, something entirely different, right? And, and that's one thing I've always really loved about Tiger Paws, that ability using those assessments, making sure that you're looking for the right talent to say, you know what, we were looking at them for this, but maybe they actually belong over here. You know, that's great advice, West, in, especially in light of what's going on right now. Um, and and that we, we've talked about continuously recruiting, right? Um, if you find somebody that's got great aptitudes, is a great culture fit um, for you, uh, is hungry to learn, is bought, buys into what, what your story and where you're going and your, and your values, hire them now. You'll find a role. They will find, you will find a way to make that person a productive member of your team. And um, yeah, I think the NFL does a, does a good job of, of that very thing. But um, in this day and age with, um, with the way things are going, you know, definitely jump at a qualified person and don't jump at the unqualified person. Don't just, don't just make those snap judgments and say, we got to have a body because that will come back to bite you. For people that are out there looking uh, or listening uh, to us today that are looking to get started on doing a better job of hiring and retention, um, if you had one piece of advice, what would that be? Don't panic. That's my one piece of advice. Don't panic. If you operate out of fear, you'll make bad decisions. You'll throw money at people that perhaps you don't want to retain. Um, or you'll, you'll do things that you think are in the best interest of your employees that they're really not. They're just out of your own personal fears. You'll hire those people who really aren't good culture fits just because they um, applied and, and are available today and, and meet your schedule requirements. If you panic, um, you'll make bad decisions. You need to take a breath and realize there are resources out there um, available to help you, um, that there are easy, inexpensive strategies that we've talked about today um, that can help you navigate the, 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 the craziness that's going on right now in the job market. But if you panic, You'll end up making bad decisions and um, you will regret it. And there will be a, a hefty price to pay. Joel, I cannot thank you enough for sharing your experience on the hiring and retention side. Um, I love the fact that your background is so diverse uh, and that especially now how useful this can be for our partners and for our customers to be able to help them with their hiring and retention needs. So thank you very much. And for everyone that's tuned in, if you're looking at uh, us today, that means you're watching us on Tiger Tube, if you're listening in on Tiger Paw Radio, thank you. And until next time, remember, keep learning.